Father, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful once again for the opportunity that you've given us to take and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is true and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were looking at the 13th verse of chapter 9. It's become quite apparent to me that chapter 9 is the proper chapter to follow chapter 8. We've looked at a lot of stuff here since we began this study. We've looked at man's fall, that no part of the plan of God was to redeem the flesh, that we were totally depraved, spiritually dead, and unable to remedy our condition. And in that condition, and that's important to realize, in that condition, we were by the grace of God justified, made righteous, without a cause. And that now sin shall not have dominion over us. We're not under the law, but under grace indwelt with the Spirit of Christ, born from above, given a new nature that cannot sin, just to find out that the old man was not eradicated, but is in constant conflict with that new man. And yet we're told that we have victory in Christ because the battle with sin is God's, not ours. That we stand before Him with no conscious guilt of sin, though the flesh never does anything good, that it never does anything to please God, but we are new creations in Christ Jesus, born from above, by the will of God, not by our will, and that all things work together for our good, that we have an intercessor, the Holy Spirit himself, who makes intercession for us because we don't know how to pray. And the list of blessings and graces goes on and on and on, and yet looking at, at most Christians today, you wouldn't know that. We found that nobody can lay a charge against God's elect, that nobody can condemn us, and the marvelous truth that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ because He loves us so much. He loves us unconditionally. And we are now seeing the purpose of chapters 9 through 11, the purpose being to show that the covenant God made with Israel has not been forgotten, but it will be fulfilled and that election is a matter of fact doctrine. It's a very matter of fact doctrine that's presented in the Word of God as it pertains to God's people, whether they be the church or Israel. And we saw how that election is not of works, not of works. And if we believe that God looked forward to see what Jacob and Esau would do, and on that basis he planned his choice, then the verse, not of works, but of him that calls or chooses, makes no sense. If it's based on works, it's based on merit, and if it's based on merit, it's not grace. God didn't love Jacob because Jacob was worthy of love, and he didn't hate Esau because Esau was worthy of hatred. If there is a reason for God loving Jacob, then it's not of grace. And if there is a reason for God hating Esau, it's of works. God deals in grace with his family. It is not based upon what we do. God loved Jacob by grace. He hated Esau because Esau was not a member of his family. And so the question the Holy Spirit foresees man asking is, and this is pretty much where we left off in the last video, does that make God unrighteous? Verse 14, and we will see that it does not. There's no more right for God to love Jacob than there is for God to hate Esau, since neither one of them have done anything. And of course, the popular human opinion is that it's because of God's foreknowledge. He could look ahead and see what kind of guy Jacob was going to be and what kind of guy Esau was going to be, and on that basis, he could love and hate. The popular opinion being that God looked ahead and saw what you were going to do, and that's the basis of your election. And nobody seems to stop and realize that if that's the case, 
that if in fact God did look ahead and see what you were going to do, and, and that's the basis of your election, then redemption is by works, and you can't come to any other conclusion. Never mind the fact that God is not a God that gains in knowledge. It is foolish for you or I to suggest that we were redeemed not by works if we believe that God looked ahead and saw what we were going to do, and then based upon our performance, he then decided to elect us. That, folks, is pure foolishness. The very foolishness that I've asked, and I ask in every prayer that God would filter out in these studies. And we have the same thing here. What should we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? Two things I want you to realize. When we looked at the verse, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, I pointed out to you that I believe the majority position is Jacob have I loved and Esau have I loved less. So, you know, I like Jacob a little bit more and I liked Esau. And I usually read in, in these commentaries, it is not right to ever suggest that God hates anybody. I would like to think, and, and, and I challenge you people, I would like to think that the conclusions I reach are based on Scripture. Now, you may not agree with my interpretation of that Scripture, but at least the opinion is based on Scripture. Where is the Scripture that would suggest it's impossible for God to hate anybody? But let's assume, let's assume that we should do what the majority position does and say that what that verse really says in verse 13 is that Jacob I have loved and Esau I have loved less. If that's true, if that's true, then verse 14 doesn't make any sense because it would be perfectly natural to like somebody a little bit more than somebody else. The only reason that I can see for the question of verse 14 is that God hated Esau. That's unrighteous, and, and so that, that genders that question. Some believe the ninth chapter of Romans is the most difficult passage of, of Scripture in all the Bible. If, if that's true, and I don't think it is, but if that's true, it is only because people are unwilling to take God at His word. I do not believe for one minute that because God said, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, that that gives me any right to question God. Now, you're more than free, I guess, to question God if you care to. I'm not going to do that. I believe that that verse says and means that God loved Jacob without a cause and hated Esau based entirely upon the sovereign process of the Almighty God. I do not think that I have any right to ever call God into question. And we're going to have another verse pretty soon. Why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will and once again teaching the truth, teaching what God says is literally true, genders the question, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. It is may get am I in the Greek, may it never be or may it never come into existence. But I think a good translation is God forbid. There's nothing wrong with that translation. Is there unrighteousness with God? No, absolutely not. And we'll use scripture to show that. The Holy Spirit does. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now the natural conclusion of verse 15 is that God's going to look at somebody and say they're worthy of mercy. And it is amazing how the human mind jumps to that conclusion. I am always opposed to any, any thought that exalts man and diminishes God. No matter what you do, folks, if you push man up, you push God down. And if you preach on man's sovereignty, that in certain areas he is sovereign, you have by that much made God less than sovereign. And I ask you, if I make statements which are not based upon some biblical principle, I want to know it, and I want to be criticized for that. I do recognize that we can have different ideas about what a verse means, but at least I want a verse that substantiates the conclusion. What we would think in verse 15 is that, is that sure, that, that, that makes sense. I, I mean, 
God's going to show mercy on those worthy of mercy. You know, you see the same illustration in the minds of Sunday school teachers. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because Noah was this really, really good guy. You know, Noah was a pretty good guy. So he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The only reason God chose Noah, folks, was because Noah wasn't like everybody else. Are you kidding me? And when the scriptures declare that every man, listen to me, every man, it doesn't say every man but Noah. It says every man's only thought was evil continually. And I have no problem concluding that that included Noah. The flesh only thinks evil. Flesh never does anything good in the eyes of God. Even the worship of the wicked is sin. The fact that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord was in no way based upon anything Noah did, but on the free exercise of the grace of the Almighty God. People don't seem to realize that. You know, it just sounds right. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, you know, because he was such a great guy. It's something Noah did. Folks, if it's something Noah did, it is not grace. It's as black and white as that. If God's dealing with Noah, if his dealing with, with Noah was based upon anything Noah did, then grace is the wrong word. In the same way in which people destroy their very theology, God looked ahead and, 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 and knew you would accept Christ, and then so therefore redemption is by works, and you've destroyed your theology. If Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because it was something that he did, then grace isn't grace, and you've destroyed your theology. But to make sure that you don't reach that conclusion on verse 15, we have verse 16. So then, it is absolutely not. Not. It is the strong negative in the Greek. It is absolutely not of him that wills, decides, nor of him that tries or runs but only of God that shows mercy. And the word run there describes one who participated in Olympic games. The text couldn't be any clearer. God's mercy is not based on anything you decide or anything you do. So verse 15 cannot be construed to say, well, sure, God's going to show mercy on those who deserve mercy, and he's going to show compassion on those who deserve compassion. Verse 16 is immediately presented by the Holy Spirit to say that that's not true. Mercy is not shown because anybody decided anything or tried anything, but only of God. I believe that Esau is of the non-elect. Some differ with that opinion. Some suggest that, that what is referred to in verse 13 is not Jacob and Esau as individuals, but Jacob and Esau as nations. And so it's, you know, basically Israel versus Edom. I think he's speaking of individuals. I think he's speaking of individuals, not nations. Obviously, there are in every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, some who are elect. This chapter points out it is not the process of the flesh. Ishmael. How was Isaac born? Child of promise. And you, brethren, are children of promise. How were you born? Long before you were ever born, God promised you to Christ. You are a child of promise, just as Isaac was a child of promise. Ishmael was not. Now, verse 16 tells us we can't reach the conclusion that mercy and compassion are based upon production. They are simply the prerogative of God. And to show that, we have verse 17. Somebody said to me the other day, boy, you're, you're going too fast here, Steve, through this uh, chapter. But this subject, folks, is extremely interesting, and it is not that complex. The simple conclusion is that God is sovereign, and God does what God wills to do. I'd almost rather say God did what God willed to do. Verse 6, I believe, in Psalm 135, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. I do not believe there is an event touching your life 
that wasn't in the original decree of God. No, I don't think he's up there making decisions. You know, look at that. Steve's horse threw him, and he got a little busted up. And so, you know, I got to figure out something. I guess I'll give him a nice cane to walk around on for a while. And if that don't work, we'll give him a wheelchair. Now, I don't think God works that way. The God I know is a God of purpose, a God of design. I don't think he's making decisions. I think he will, and it is done. And your life and your times are in his hands, and people say, what an awful thing. You know, Steve, you've, you've made people robots. If you think it's awful, folks, to be in the hands of the loving, sovereign God, be my guest. I think it's wonderful to know the peace, the rest, and the joy that this God, this God of all power, is working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure, that he has de declared that all things work together for my good. What if they don't? What if all things do not work together for my good? Am I any worse off? No. I ought to be in hell anyway. But God is destroyed. God's reputation is destroyed. He's a liar. He's not trustworthy. You can't count on him. If he isn't working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, he's not trustworthy. And you can flail about, and, and, and all, all your frustration won't make any difference. And we have verse 17. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, and I'm thrilled to death that that's there. It could say that God said unto Pharaoh. It says the scripture said unto Pharaoh. If we look back in Exodus, we find out it's God who said unto Pharaoh, For the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. And some Christian is going to say, Steve, God didn't really do this in the way that you read it. This is what Pharaoh wanted to do, and all God did was allow Pharaoh to do what God uh, wanted to do. Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. Now I'm willing to take that at face value, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. That's why Pharaoh was there. I'm reminded that as Christ stood before Pilate, Pilate was frustrated. Don't you realize, Pilate said to Christ, you know, hasn't it crossed your mind that I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? There's no greater power than mine right now. I could dismiss this case and you say nothing. And, and what did Christ say? Could have said, oh, Pilate, I, you know, I didn't realize that. You know, please let me go. Thou wouldst have no power at all if it had not been given thee from above. And Pilate declared the power he had was the ability to set Christ free. What did he want to do? He wanted to set him free. He labored, folks, to set him free. I'll take Barabbas. There's no way they'd choose Barabbas over Christ. Pilate wanted to set Christ free. What did he do? Condemned him to be crucified. Jesus Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel of God. He was foreordained to that. You could have fought to, you, to the death to save Christ from crucifixion. You would not have won. For the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. And who is Pharaoh? Who is he? As far as the times were concerned, probably the most powerful man on earth. Why was the most powerful man on earth in that office because it was so that God might show his power in him and that his name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardens or makes stubborn. And once again, people stumble over their spurs. He really didn't harden Pharaoh's heart. He just allowed Pharaoh's hardened heart to, to function. You know, do, do with it what you will. I believe that God has mercy on whom he will, and whom he will he hardens. That's what it says. That's what I believe. And that prompts the following question. You see, if that isn't true, if God just allowed Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh wanted to do and had no sovereign control in that situation, 
then you would not have verse 19. Why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? There would be no reason to even bring up the question. But since man has such a, a violent reaction to God being sovereign, God presents man's question. And dearly beloved, that question is gendered by our simply not taking the 18th verse at face value. He shows mercy on whom he will and whom he wills, he hardens. Well then, why does he find fault? Can't find any fault with Pharaoh. Pharaoh did exactly what God designed to be done. What is the answer? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? It's that simple. I don't have any better answer. Don't you think, Steve, that makes God unrighteous? Absolutely not. A righteous God cannot function unrighteously. A good tree cannot bear evil fruit, and an evil tree cannot bear good fruit. Those are simple biblical principles, folks, as well as common sense. A righteous God cannot do unrighteously. It's a stupid question. It, it, it really doesn't deserve an answer, and I want you to notice it didn't get one. It got a response, but it didn't get an answer. In fact, it was answered with a question. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? It's interesting, that verse, if you look at the text in the Greek, it's very emphatic. Who are you, O man, that thou would repliest against God, oppose God, go against God? Now, I, will, I won't do that. I just can't do that. I will, I will not do that. The God that I know is a God of all power, all power. It's that God who holds me in the hollow of his hand. It's that God who is with me. Moses said, show me thy way. Show me what you planned for my life. What was the answer? My presence will go with you. Didn't show him a thing. My presence will go with you. And he dwells within you, and he is with you. If you look at the lives of Christians today, you, you stand astounded. There are those who don't seem to have a single problem in their life. There are those who have burdens that you think that if you had to bear them, you couldn't make it. I don't know, folks, why God deals, why, he, why God deals with his own people the way that he does. But the God I know is not only sovereign, but he is a God of love and comfort to those who are his own. And I will continue to say that you are what you are, where you are, because it is God who is working in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. We don't know the whole plan, but we know his presence is with us as we anxiously await our final and complete deliverance. Look, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.